very much, Matt. So as uh, Matt mentioned today, I will be talking about the 19th century Summer Empire, and I'll just talk a bit about what it is and also why it's still relevant today. So before you go in, uh, this is a chart that's made by uh, Matt, and it basically he collects the facade fire incident for the past 30 years. So all these incidents are taken from news outlets. So basically events or incidents where journalists think that it's worthy to be reported in the news. So as you can see from the chart, uh, for the past 30 years, you can see a very uh, st a steadily increasing trend of a uh, facade fire. But uh, not all facade fire are Not all facade fire are the same. So, on twenty fourteen, you have one of these uh, facade fire in Australia. This La Crosse building, where the flame actually spread up the building just not very quickly. Fortunately, no one lost their life in this incident. Uh, in twenty fifteen, another case in Dubai. This is the Taj, which is a high end apartment building. Again, there was a facade fire that's spread very quickly off the building and no one is injured in this scenario but as you all know 2017 Red Tower happened and unfortunately in this event 72 people lost their life so as you can see despite the fact that these are all facade fire not all facade fire are the same some are more severe than the other although looking at the picture you can't really tell why and uh, this was deemed to be one of the worst fires in the UK uh, after the World War II. But not many people know that this is not the first case in the, in, in the UK. So in 1973, there was a Summerland fire that happened. And very similar, it's also kind of like a facade fire. And the fire was seen to be burning very intensely both inside and outside the building. And this has resulted in 50 deaths and 80 seriously injured. So I'm just gonna go through the entire event and uh, see why this is a case and why it's similar to uh, the facade fire that we see today. But before I go into the details, I'm just going to go through the timeline of what actually happened and just to give you an idea of what the Summerland is and what the building is meant to be. So, the Isle of Man, which is one of the, uh, is where the building is built, it's actually a uh, island that's very heavily uh, dependent on revenues from tourism. So in the, tw nine, in the ninth, uh, 20th century, early 20th century, most of these tourists actually come from the UK and because it's cheaper to travel to the Isle of Man, uh, most people actually back then would decide to go to the Isle of Man. But after World War II, because travel becomes a bit more affordable to go to mainland Europe, most of the tourists from the UK decided that they would go to the Mediterranean for have to have their holidays. And this has took a toll on the Isle of Man's revenue. And as a response to that, the government decided to commission Summerland as a response. Uh, the Summerland building, it's actually a very large transparent building that was meant to imitate the weather you get in the Mediterranean. And it's meant to be one of the first buildings to have uh, multiple recreation activities in the building. So, you know, for example, a swimming pool, amusement area, bar, disco, children play area. So it's an all-in-one building and it's a very innovative uh, design back in these days. So construction begins in 1968 and it uh, finished construction in 1971 where it opened as well to its customer. So this is what it looks like back in the day when it first opened. So it's a 
quite uh, innovative building, I would say, back in those days. So the building itself is seven story high, uh, about 22 meters from level one to level seven. It's meant to hold 5,000 people. Uh, it has 15 stairs, but only one stair that serves most level. And it's meant to be open to the public and also Summerland building, uh, sorry, Summerland staff. Uh, in this park, I will only consider from level four to level seven because that's the level where it's destroyed by the fire. The anywhere below level four, it's not damaged by the fire, and everyone that's under level four is not uh, injured by the fire as well. So, what happened? So. The fire occurs, as you know, on the 2nd of August, 1923, when three students or boys were smoking near a damaged kiosk. Uh, they lighted their matches, lighted their cigarette, and then they discarded it onto the kiosk. We don't know whether it was intentional or not, but that's not, because it's not uh, deemed to be worth investigating whether if it's intentional. But what we do know is that Within minutes, this kiosk was caught on fire. And after 30 minutes, uh, the fire was seen to be burning very extensively on the building facade. And it was also about this time that the uh, fire brigade arrived on the scene. But very unfortunate that at this point, the fire was deemed too well developed and there's nothing much the firefighters can do to suppress it. So what they did was just to prevent it from spreading to the next building and after an hour the fire eventually just burned out. So in short, the fire from start to, to, to total burn up takes about one and a half hours. So the question now is how did the fire spread so quickly and why does it take the fire brigade 30 minutes to arrive on the scene? and why just a single lighted match could you know result in 50 death so before i go into all that i just want to talk about very quickly the layers of protection that a normal building has so there's six layers in total the first layer is prevention second layer is detection third layer is evacuation the fourth compartmentation fifth suppression and the last one was structural resilience. I will go a bit into what it is in the next few slides and also how it failed in Summerland. But in the Summerland building itself, of the six layers, five of these layers actually failed. Oops. There you go. <laughs> and uh, yep, yeah, I'll just go into the failure of the prevention layer. So the prevention layer basically ensures that you do not have uh, self-sustaining fire on the building so you try to prevent that and the way you do it is to either remove uh, combustible material that you have on the facade or you remove any uh, fuel that you can from uh, the facade itself that's combustible no, no, it's not habitat and the facade but anything that's uh, combustible. So in this case, in Summerland, the prevention layer was severely compromised for two reasons. The first reason is they did not store away this uh, dismantled damaged uh, kiosk. And the second one would be the use of extremely uh, flammable materials. So just going to the first one, the kiosk was not stored away safely, so Two months prior to the fire, there was a very severe storm that damaged one of these fiberglass kiosks. So uh, back then, the procedure was that when you have a damaged kiosk, what you do is you dismantle it and you store it into the uh, storage area. So the kiosk was just around that area. And because this damaged kiosk was not uh, stored, it eventually becomes the, the few that started the Summerland fire. On the other hand, 
just having a view is not enough if the, the facade is not flammable. So we're going to look into what material they use for their facade as well. So in this case, there's three materials that they use and all three of them are extremely uh, flammable. I'm going to go into each of the material in the next slides, but to give you a view of uh, how much of this uh, material is covering the building, I'm going to show you this, uh, this image. And as you can see, I would say that a good percentage of the building is actually all uh, flammable. So the material that they use are as shown on that paper, so you have three materials. The first one is PMMA, which is basically just kind of like a plastic. The second one is a uh, steel sheet, but it was also coated with uh, bitumen, which is very flammable. And lastly, Dactylene, which it's a sun absorbent uh, fiber board, but it's coated with plastic. Again, all these materials are very flammable. But there are there are regulations that would have uh, stopped it from being used in the building. So the three regulations that we are interested <laughs> are the uh, bylaw thirty nine that requires all external work to be non combustible and fire resistant for at least two hours. And then you have the other one for the uh, bylaw thirty seven that says that if you have any cavity, uh, it has to be fire stopped. And lastly, you have bylaw 50 that says any roof material has to be adequately uh, protected from a uh, spread of fire. <laughs> or how any of these laws are broken. So we we'll just go into the first one. Uh, oral glass, how did oral glass get approved? So the first thing is that uh, the designer initially argued that oral glass is not combustible, which is PMMA is not combustible. We know that it's not true now. But the reason why it was approved was back then PMMA was considered quite new, it's quite innovative, no one knows this property. And they did a test based on uh, British Standard 467, which in essence basically it's you take a sample of your material, you hold it up vertically, you apply fire to the center of your sample for 10 seconds, you remove it. If the material stops burning, then it's considered safe uh, to have passed the, the, the test itself. So one of the professor that was looking into this, uh, Professor Douglas, it basically says that uh, any materials that's at least four millimeter thick would have passed the test regardless of uh, how bad it would perform in real life. And because that it passed that test, uh, the community, the planning community that was looking into this decided that if it passed uh, this test, it would also wouldn't contravene uh, bylaw 50, which states that your roof has to be uh, adequately protected from a uh, spread of fire. So for that two reason, the oral gas is used for both the facade and also for the roof as uh, the, 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 the material for the roof and the, the, the facade. Having said that, the chief fire staff, which is part of the uh, fire uh, brigade, when they look through the, 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 the planning material and material that is going to be used in the building itself, he did make it clear that this material is combustible. But he felt that because at that time, when he looked into the planning and everything, he says that, okay, there's <laughs> adequate uh, evacuation. And he felt that you know this uh, material would not pose any risk. So he raised no object. Uh, objections to the uh, the use of this material as for southern roof. <laughs> as for the galvestos, uh, the use was basically basically the uh, planning commission was not aware that a waiver is required. So I'll give a bit of context of what actually happened. This wall was meant to be concrete, but uh, due to like basically financial restrictions <laughs> they realized that they had to change for something a bit, a bit cheaper and the designer decided to use Galvestos so when they put it on and asked for a waiver they did not make it clear that that was changed and the planning community assumed that <laughs> the designer was asking to reconfirm the use of aura glass so what they did is that they, they put it on, they, they basically say, yep, uh, it's all fine, that you can use it, but they did not make it clear that the approval is just for oral glass. 
So the designer thought that it's approved and there's no further uh, advice that's sought from the cheese fire staff. So for that all or that reason, the uh, Galva stores was also used uh, on the building without having like a proper backing process. So lastly, uh, the use of the cavity and dacolin that uh, those combustibles. So by law 49 that requires fire stopping for any combustible uh, insulation. Unfortunately, due to technicality, the, the formation of this cavity is not considered a cavity in the in the bylaw of the uh, uh, government of Max. And for that reason, there's no need to actually <laughs> install any uh, fire stopping material. And also because decaline was a substitute for a plaster board, which is supposed to be non-combustible, and because it was such a sudden need to have uh, insulation in the building, <laughs> basically the designer do not have time to look into what the fire properties of the, uh, the material is. And as a result, the designer are not, not, doesn't know what it is and they just install it without seeking for any more advice from the fire experts. And with that, basically, unfortunately, the use of family material has contributed to a gross failure in the uh, prevention layer. So when you have a failure in prevention layer, the detection layer should be able to inform uh, the people affected by it to evacuate the building. So what that means is that you have to, the detection layer should be able to ensure occupants to leave the building in a timely manner and also inform the emergency service that there is a fire and they should be on their way to actually tackle the fire. So in the case of Summerland, the fire was <laughs> discovered almost immediately, but uh, the fire brigade was not informed of the fire until it was very well developed. So the question is how, how does it happen? So to look into it, uh, the fire alarm system in Summerland can be split into two different systems. So you have the first system where it's uh, meant for the public to actually activate, and you have the, which basically doesn't sound the alarm immediately to avoid like panic, like false alarm, but it should always uh, notify the fire station immediately. You also have the staff alarm that would immediately sound the, uh, the siren, but uh, also immediately inform the fire station. In the case of the uh, fire, uh, Summerland fire, two of these public alarm was uh, triggered. But the question is why does it still take the uh, fire brigade so long to arrive at the scene? So this was due to uh, the public alarm mechanism was tampered, the delay caused to the fire brigade. And the reason for this is because the Summerland management felt that there is too much uh, false alarm. They do not want to kind of like send too many uh, false alarm to the fire brigade. So what they did is they changed the system to delay the call. This was not approved by the chief fire staff at the fire station, but it was done nonetheless. And obviously this has resulted in a very delayed call to the uh, fire station. But what about the staff fire alarm? The staff should have sounded the alarm anyway, but this was not the case because the staff were too busy fighting the fire and they forgot to actually do the most important thing, which is to sound the fire alarm. Uh, the one staff that's in the control room that were overseeing the entire operation was not trained to actually do what she uh, had to do. And as a result, they actually left the room without actually uh, triggering the alarm first. And all of this has resulted in the fire brigade only being notified <laughs> after 21 minutes. And ironically, it they were only notified by passerby of the building. So no one in the building actually notified the fire brigade of the fire. And that basically put staff training and also unauthorized alteration to the alarm system has resulted in like the 
really bad uh, failure of the uh, detection system, at least in summer life. So uh, the evacuation layer. So if all fail, the building should still enable your user, the building users, to evacuate <coughs> the building safely. So in Summerland fire, the, the, the evacuation layer failed for two reasons. The first one is due to poor staff management. And second one is just a really poorly thought out layout of the building. So we'll just quick go through the staff management part. So uh, the evacuation layer, the, the, the procedure to evacuate your, your user in the building cannot be improvised because it's a very complicated process. You need to basically plan it from the very beginning to make sure that everyone is coordinated to basically guide the uh, user out of the building. So to do this, the building management initially for the, when it, before it actually opens to the public has actually dropped out a document that basically says the responsibility of the staff and what they actually do, the, the routine for the drills. So all of these uh, procedures are well documented. Unfortunately, because Summerland itself it's, uh, has a very high staff turnover, uh, and that has resulted in all this knowledge gradually lost throughout, and basically the existence of this document are also lost. So as a result of staff not aware of this document, by the time when the fire occurs, no one in the building actually knows what to do. And this has resulted in you know, staff not being able to guide uh, the, the users in the building of the building. No one actually removed like the unlocked the emergency exits or removing like obstacle out of the door. And to make it worse, some of the procedures the staff took have made the uh, situation even worse. So an example of this is during the fire, one of the staff actually cut off power supply because they thought that the, by removing the electric city in the building, it would have made it safer for the, uh, the occupants. But obviously when you do that, it becomes really dark in the building and that made the evacuation process even worse for the occupants in the building. Also, uh, for the poor layout of the building, uh, when it was first designed, there was quite a generous uh, stairway and exit plan for all the occupants, but this was changed throughout the design process and it was not uh, consulted with any expert in the field. And as a process, and as a, as a result of that, when the chief fire staff arrived on the scene when it opens the day prior, he realized that the building that he saw is not the same that he saw on the plan, and he has to close the building for a bit and make sure that they improve the the stairway and everything. But it was not enough; it was just ever so slightly, and it's still not. It's basically fundamentally not the same building that he saw on the plan on the first day. Also, because when they were building the building, they did not actually plan out how each of the uh, shops are gonna be at, and that was all an afterthought. They have a situation where kids' uh, entertainments are above the parents' entertainment area, and that has resulted in a really uh, bad situation when there's fire, because parents are trying to look for their kid on the upper floor, and now you have like two uh, opposite direction flow on the stairway that's already very congested. And as a result, you have very uh, slow evacuation from the building. Also, there's very few exit signs and direction signs in the building. So in, as a result, you have what they call a ship syndrome where everyone would try to exit from the same exit that they came coming from. And this obviously has resulted in a very congested exit. So for all of that uh, failure, it has resulted in a really, really poor uh, 
evacuation protection layer by the way by the management side of things <laughs> So, uh, so the other failure that we have is the uh, failure of compartmentation. So the compartmentation basically ensures that failure does not spread quickly throughout the building. But in this case, it failed because of the nature of the building itself, that's meant to be open, so you, there's not much they can do. But it could have been still much better than it was in the Summerland. So the first one obviously is the lack of cavity barrier within that uh, cavity that allows fire to spread really quickly. Also, because of how the the evacuate the building, and also the firefighting team that's in the the building itself, all this stuff that's meant to handle the firefighting equipment that's available in the building, these staffs are not trained to to basically use the fire extinguisher, water hose, and fire hydrant when available. And unfortunately, this has resulted in not only them not uh, alerting the proper person to come to fight the fire, they've also not been able to actually suppress the fire uh, with the equipment that's available. And as a result, the suppression layer in the building has failed uh, tremendously. So, the conclusion in this the, in this uh, fire basically there's about 34 recommendations that was made by the commissioners, but I'm just going to show you a few uh, a few com uh, conclusion that's found in this uh, build in this fire. So the first one is basically the uh, Summerland <laughs> fire demonstrate basically the danger of not fully understanding the fire safety design in the building. So there's a lot of modification that was done on the building without knowing its initial intention. And this has resulted in a really, really poor uh, building in terms of like fire safety. Also, innovative material should be encouraged because it basically helps drive forward uh, the, the current building design. But the fire properties of this material should be fully understood before they are actually used. And actually, fortunately, this is not the case in the Summerland fire. And lastly, fire expert uh, opinions should have been taken in different stages. This was not taken because, as you can, as you remember earlier, as mentioned, some of the uh, design that was initially looked over by the fire experts, when they come in to have a final check, they realized that the building they see is not the same as what they saw on the plan. And should this have happened, they probably have more chances to actually right the wrong. So. Has the lesson been learned? I guess that's the question that we have today. So, I don't know about the case currently, but 11 years after the fire, Professor Dennis Harper, which is part of the panel on the commission, said that many of the building then still has the same problem as part of the Summerland fire. So, this was one of the plate that was on the Summerland uh, site. It says that we will not forget. And it's true that uh, the memory should jog on on the, on the summer the lesson because those who have not taken notice will eventually find that repeating again. And probably that's what is still the case in the, in the current climate. So with that, I'm gonna end my presentation and I'd just like to thank everyone that's supported my work thus far. <laughs>